Welcome to the Experience Focus Leaders Podcast. I am delighted to introduce you to Peter Fader, the legendary Wharton marketing, pro- yes, legendary <laughs> Wharton marketing professor, um, a serial entrepreneur with an exit to the likes of Nike, and um, an inventor of the customer lifetime value calculation as we know it. He is an author of four books on customer centricity, really the definitive uh, set of knowledge you want to go from very high level to very detailed. Um, and um, I'm just honored to uh, to have him as a friend and a guest on this podcast after a few years of uh, working together, including uh, having Peter be one of the first uh, backers of Relay2. So thank you very much, Peter, for coming on board. Alex, I appreciate all those kind words, and it's 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 people like you and technologies that you've built that uh, make it possible to do all the things that that uh, that, that you mentioned. So, it goes both ways. Amazing. Well, Peter, I I think the reason you're the first uh, faculty member of any institution, even though we love the research that comes out of uh, of, of our alma mater, like Wharton. Um, is that you really are the ultimate, in my view, uh, applier and doer, not just a researcher and a teacher. And, um, you know, one of the stories that obviously I know is the the story of the Zodiac, a company which you founded, got venture backed and exited very successfully to Nike, validating a lot of your research on um, on customer lifetime value and backing that vision was a tremendous exit. And now you're um, a, C- a founder of Theta, which is doing the same thing for customer lifetime value-based valuations of companies and businesses. Um, so tell us a little bit about what drives you to combine uh, research with going and starting your own businesses or backing businesses and, and being so focused on application of your ideas. That's a couple of things. Uh, one is that I wasn't born to be a business school professor. You know, there's a, a lot of folks here, uh, we have wonderful colleagues. So I think, you know, when they were eight, they, they'd say, you know, mommy, I want to be a marketing professor. I wasn't like that. I, I kind of got dragged into it when I was actually uh, planning on just going to work in industry. Uh, uh, but I've always loved crunching numbers and forecasting things and coming up with with algorithms and 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 insights that arise from them. Um, so it's not surprising that I went uh, down this path to to do the publish or perish professor thing. It did take some some coaxing by some of my my mentors uh, up mm-hmm. at MIT. Uh, but but once I was here, uh, I said I'm not going to give up my values. Yes, it's mm-hmm. going to be publish or perish. Yes, I'm just going to be judged by you know how many academic articles I can get in in journals that no one reads. I understand that that's. That's the day job. That's the, what's going to kind of drive my my salary and professional success. Uh, but my inherent interest is still in watching people use this stuff and making better decisions and kind of raising their quantitative literacy and just viewing the whole field of marketing in a very different way. So I take those parts really seriously. And I'm fortunate that the research that I do uh, enables uh, that that kind of industry outreach. Just, just I, just, I'm I'm lucky that I can kind of do both without them being uh, without them coming at the expense of each other. Well, I, I think you're too modest because I I understand that one of the papers that you published got to be one of the most read um, marketing papers in the in the history of the of the kind of the channel. Do you want to tell it? And ended up on Jim Cramer's. Uh, show. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that and can we part of your to. latest adventure with Theta? So I think that would be great for people to know how you're really making marketing turn into dollars uh, yeah, for so investors I, I, and companies. So let me back up and give the 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 kind of the, the context for that paper, which again, it's I, I just like predicting customer behavior. The the ultimate behavioral metric is customer lifetime value. Um, you say I invented it. Not really. I mean, the, the, the concepts have been around for a while. A lot of people put lifetime value models out there. And what I've done is I've taken some of the work by other people, other smarter, more creative people, and just help refine it, improve mm-hmm. it, add some bells and whistles, make it a little bit more accessible, motivate people to want to use it. So 
Uh, so I, I'm I'm not going to be too modest. Yes, I've ha I've had some some really great contributions, but they just wouldn't be possible without other folks first putting the ideas out there. And for me, both academically and practically, I, I've always wondered how well can we do with how little. Mm. So so if yeah, if I have a full transaction log from a company, I'm going to build great models. But suppose I don't. Suppose the data are limited in different kinds of ways. Uh, either uh, there's data missing or the data is overly aggregated. There's a, a lot of different kinds of very practical data questions. And I've just always wondered, you know, first of all, how can we build the same models if we have the limited data? And number two, how much worse will they be? So there's been a big theme of the research. Uh, again, a lot of the papers were just to get more lines on my curriculum vita and get that you know salary bump. Uh, but it just turns out, and it really is coincidence, with the rise of GDPR, you know, just mm. overall interest in privacy, with you know Apple pulling the rug out from the digital marketing world and just making it much harder to collect granular data, and no, a lot of these cookies, models, huh? yeah, really yeah, a lot of these very, models uh, that are, yeah. mm -hmm. yeah. a lot of models I was building kind of anyway, all of a sudden take on just, just great value, uh, and, and and the ultimate way of of kind of uh, of, of limiting data is, is less about technology and more about financial reporting. Uh, you know, look, no company is ever going to put their transaction logs or any kind of granular data out there in their reports. No company should ever say, you know, here is the lifetime value of of, of customers. So, so the big question is, what kinds of metrics is it that, that companies could put out there? And again, how do we then reverse engineer and run the models that we'd run if we had all the detailed data? It's something I've always wondered about um, and and kind of noodled around with. But it wasn't until meeting my PhD student, my co-author, my co-founder, Dan mm -hmm. McCarthy, this was his dissertation work. Uh, so, so Dan came back here. He, he was an undergrad here, didn't take my course, mm -hmm. came back to get his PhD in statistics, not even in marketing. And through a, a, a mutual acquaintance here, another graduate student, um, we met and it was like love at first sight because Dan had some history on Wall Street. Uh, he, was a, he was a hedge fund guy. Um, uh, but he's a brilliant statistician. And when I started just asking these questions, more from an academic standpoint, how do we squeeze as much value out of as little data as possible, understanding that a perfect domain for that would be customer-based corporate valuation. We then started on a mission, a mission that involved data. Can we find companies that actually do reveal some aggregated metrics about their customers? A mission that involved math. So, you know, can we... Can we uh, kind of redesign our models to work on some of those kinds of limited data sets? Again, data that companies might and do put in their actual quarterly reports. Um, and, you know, gospel spreading. You know, how do we get these ideas out there? Not just the techniques themselves, right. um, but the insights that arise from them and and the the, the need to do this kind of stuff. So, so Dan's been just, just really prolific. He's just a, a brilliant researcher. But his dissertation, I just, you know, I keep them right near me here, even though these papers are a few years old. The paper that, that, that you referred to, Alex, is this one over here. Valuing subscription-based businesses using publicly disclose customer data. Um, this this paper, when we first wrote it, uh, so this is the published version, but when we first wrote it, uh, it then kind of, we post on a website where people share their papers, a, a site called SSRN, Social Science Research Network. And this paper, and then its follow-up, you know, kind of rose right to the top of the list. One of the reasons why they've been among the, I think this one is still the number one most downloaded paper ever. This one's somewhere in the top 10. Um, one of the reasons for that is because they're not only of great interest to marketing professors and marketing professionals, but also to finance professors and professionals. That this idea of customer-based corporate valuation really is, a, it's a wonderful crossover. It, it doesn't only help marketers say, huh, here's a nice domain where our yeah. insights, our models can 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 help. But 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 for finance and accounting people to say, huh, never thought about that before. Maybe we really should be looking more carefully at 
customer level disclosures, the role that they could play in valuation models, and the improvements that we can see in projecting future revenue, cash flow, EBITDA. And that's all we're doing is basically taking the frameworks out of finance and accounting, bringing in some marketing metrics, to, uh, basically showing how we can squeeze value out of some of that marketing data in ways that finance and accounting would have never thought about, but in ways that marketers have been talking about for decades, best of all worlds. Um, and the nice thing about it, I'm going to give credit not only to Dan, but even to our academic reviewers. When we first started writing these things up, we did it almost just kind of theoretically. Here's stuff mm -hmm. you could do if you mm -hmm. had these disclosures. And the reviewers said, no, 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 no. You need to name names. You need to name specific companies and tell us what they're worth in reality relative to what Wall Street thinks they're worth. So in this first paper, um, we did it, um, I, I was going to say four, but not four. We did it two because we had no interaction with the companies. We're just taking public mm -hmm. data about DISH Network and Sirius XM satellite radio. Mm -hmm. And we showed the dish, uh, our, our, that our models were pretty close to what Wall Street said, but to the extent that they were different, we showed that dish was overvalued and Sirius XM was undervalued. And here we are, um, you know, six years later, and sure enough, their stocks have moved exactly in the directions that we said they should back when we were doing the research. And you were able to capture the publicly available data in this case in terms of their subscription numbers and movements and so on. Well, That's so right. Here and we go. So public service announcement of your hedge fund uh, or private equity professional listening to this podcast here or YouTube video, please check out the work that Peter is doing at Theta Equity Partners. Is that, is well, that it's, we've kind of shortened it. So ThetaCLV.com. ThetaCLV is the new... Brand and it's the website is thetaclv.com. That's, that right? right. That's, That's right. That's right. Um, and there's so many examples too. And I mentioned a couple in the published papers, but we do a lot of these other things for fun. So yeah. whether it's uh, uh, companies going public, you know, looking at their at their S1 filings, or other companies that just happen to put a lot of good metrics out there in the public domain. Um, so you know, so we do this work commercially more on the private side, working with private equity firms and, and other yeah. investors. Uh, but but it really is great to kind of show off and go out on a limb and say, this is what, let's say, a Warby Parker is actually worth as opposed to what Wall Street right. says. That's a great example where when they went public, they were grossly overvalued, but today they're undervalued and we absolutely believe in what we're doing. Now, people shouldn't take stock tips from a marketing professor. That's always a bad idea. Um, but there's, I think, a lot of really useful insights uh, from the analyses themselves. Well, this is this is beyond the stock tips. You're basically creating alpha here. And um, I think what I love about this is the perennial challenge of the perception of marketers and CMOs is that they are these sort of fluffy, you know, vague, non non quantifiable things, or if they're quantifiable, they're kind of very lower level things like the leads that we get, and none of the focus on the um, on the you know either the customer dimension of it, uh, not as sophisticated about deaveraging that, you know. So let's back up a little bit and dive into, you know, what are the sort of the I guess the myth about customer lifetime value and what's the reality and broadly like customer centricity as a core, you know, component of this, because when people say, Hey, I'm customer centric, you know, the assumption is like, I just, you know, follow around my customers and do everything they say, which is actually exactly the opposite of your work, right? Like what you're trying that to say is not right. all customers are created equal and you need to respect them and respect your business, uh, including your finance organizations, because the only way you will kind of support it as a marketer or or sales organization is, is by understanding that difference. Please dive into that a little okay. bit. Okay. Well, uh, first of all, Alex, just, just hearing you say all that stuff, there's a lot to unpack there, but just hearing you say it, hearing you embrace a, a lot of these ideas, uh, uh, yeah, that, that just, that's a great validation right there that people are, are taking this stuff seriously. You know, to, to, to your question, uh, myths and misconceptions, first about CLV, a lot of companies out there who say, well, that's all well and good, but our company is different. Our customers are different. Our market is different. The kinds of headwinds that we're facing in the marketplace are different. 
It's a bunch of nonsense. Um, and so what I'm trying to do is not only come up with the world's best lifetime value models, but the world's simplest, because mm. I want to make them broadly applicable. I want to basically knock down all the excuses um, why you think this one wouldn't apply to you or why you couldn't uh, implement it yourself. It's that just right balance between you know, state of the art in terms of the, you know, the, the, the math and the computation, um, but also, um, you know, well, wow, I, why, why wouldn't we give this a try? Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's one part of it is that actually we really can come up with, with some fairly you know, standardized ways of looking at lifetime value. Now, it is going to be different for a subscription business versus a more discretionary business like a, like a retailer. Sure, we'll have different lifetime value models. We'll have about, you know, four or five or six different ones for different kinds of business settings. So that's number one. Uh, it, it, it can apply very broadly. And number two, there's not just one lifetime value formula. Too many people write these white papers and say, here is the formula. No, it depends on the nature of the business. You can't use the same approach for a subscription business as you use for a non-contractual discretionary business. So there's myth right. number two. And then myth number three is uh, there's a lot of folks who believe that we can't they, they actually like the idea of forecasting custom behavior, but they, they don't believe we can do it over a lifetime. They, they don't believe that we can do it over really long horizons. Because once again, they think that things are going to change a lot. There's just a lot of stuff about custom behavior or just human behavior that's incredibly predictable over long horizons. Uh, and it goes back to what I was doing as an undergrad at MIT before mm -hmm. becoming a marketing professor. Um, I was on the path to become an actuary. Mm. Uh, and if you look at the ways that insurance companies come up with their rates, you know, they don't know exactly when, when you're going to die, Alex, but they can look at people who share similar behavioral characteristics to you and say, what percent of you are going to live to be 80 years old? So by having those long run. I hope it's, it's 100 <laughs> percent. Well, well, I just looking from, you know, at, at knowing some of your good, clean habits, you know, yeah. And, uh, yeah, you know them, I'm not yeah. looking. I don't see any Maybe cigars or motorcycles behind you. Yeah. So, um, um, so, so we, that that's the perspective is to, is to take very yeah. much actuarial viewpoints to be able to make long run horizon forecasts and to validate them, validate them, validate them to show that we're going to take your data and we're going to come up with a long holdout period that's sometimes going to be even longer than the amount of data we use to run the models and show it works. It works in the aggregate. It works at a granular level and then building our bridge to customer centricity. Um, there's a whole lot of big so what that emerges from it. It's not just a good forecast, but it's a forecast that's going to make you go, whoa, we why ought to be running doing? our business differently. Differently, exactly. Like, that why takes are us we... to the customer centricity. Right. Uh, and that's why, uh, you know, again, I'm a forecasting guy. I like the data. I like the models. But I looked at the implications from the models and started saying, wait a minute, this goes against the grain of a lot of conventional marketing thinking. And this is too important to ignore. And that's why I started writing the books. And that's why I started, and maybe badly, um, but that's why I started talking about this idea. And, and Alex, you said it perfectly. These words, customer centricity, are easy to misinterpret. It makes it sound like we love every customer. I can't sleep at night until the no. least happy customer is satisfied. No, that's not what we're talking about. Really, it's a matter of which customers do we want to be centered around? Or as the subtitle says, let's focus on the right customers for strategic advantage. Let's not you know, upset anyone. Let's not fire customers, but let's not pretend that we're going to be everybody's best friend either and figure out how to find that balance, figure out how to allocate resources and to measure the impact of those actions. That's customer centricity. And what's interesting is I think a lot of your work is on the existing customers, right? We, are, you know, I'd relate to focus on oftentimes helping you acquire new customers, but the oh, two absolutely. are really connected, right? And sometimes people... Uh, miss this part right where if you do a good job analyzing who are the new who are the customers that are succeeding the most with your product fit or service you know who are easy to serve or cost you know cost effective to serve who go on and spread your word spread your message for example folks like yourself uh you know we want to have more customers like that right and so then when we go out into the world right, and build our demand generation or demand capture, 
uh, strategies and tactics, we have this insight. And I, I'm kind of worried that a lot of marketers, you know, are so disconnected from that actually operational customer, su customer who, who is the successful customer, what's the ideal customer profile in reality, right? They kind of have some hypothesis that they go out and, and do a bunch of, you know, malpractice, frankly, mal marketing malpractice that costs money and ca causes problems downstream. And so you end up kind of having a bubble bursting with all these software businesses in, the, in our universe that just kind of acquired crazily the wrong type of customers, wasting investors' money and so on and so forth. So tell that us is a little right. bit about more. Why haven't those folks listened to what you're working I'm on? Did working they listen on and it. they just ha had different incentives? Like, what are some of the issues that kind of people- That's a big part this? of it. Oh, where do we begin? So first of all, a lot of it's organizational, that there's just a real disconnect between the kind of the, you know, the the folks who are out there, you know, hunting and gathering customers versus the, the folks who are, you know, working on the care and feeding of existing ones. Uh, very often, completely different people, they don't talk to each other. In fact, they're sometimes at odds with each other, different metrics, different tactics, just this complete lack of alignment within the organization. So, so, so we kind of start there. We can also talk externally that there's too many companies, a lot of those software companies, uh, even the you know, digitally native retailers, um, where all they were, were rewarded for was top line growth. That, that sometimes yeah. it's the VCs who are a little bit naive, a little bit short sighted, and all they see are these, you know, hockey stick curves, but they're not looking at the quality of the, the, the customers that, that are being acquired, just the sheer quantity. And they're, as, as you pointed it out, they're not looking uh, very carefully at, at the costs of doing those acquisitions. And so it's, it's just a, a ugly wild west out there about the ways that the company do and report these customer acquisition activities. Again, for me, it's been just an amazing lesson learning from Dan McCarthy, not only in terms of forecasting the, the, the number of customers and the revenue from them, I mean, that's stuff mm. I've been doing all along, but the cost of doing so and to being just as rigorous about CAC as, as we are about the revenue we get from them, holding companies accountable, finding inconsistencies in the things they're doing, the things they're reporting and so on. Uh, I'm not an accountant and, and it's kind of on, on thin ice when I even talk about this this kind of stuff. But man, oh man, is it important? So, so it's you know, it's internal, it's external. Uh, the, the the fixes on one hand are pretty easy to create the right kind of alignment, to put out the right kinds of metrics, to have the right kinds of you know scrutiny from from external stakeholders. Mm -hmm. But they're also really hard, just because old habits die hard. It's one of the reasons I love working with, uh, for instance, um, uh, uh, companies that that outside the U.S., you know, companies in in Europe and and Asia and so on, where um, where where they don't have as many like you know bad VC practices kind of kind of built in. That maybe we could we could start with the good stuff and 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 watch companies flourish. So I'm always looking for clean slates like that. As much as I, I want to help old line companies improve. Uh, it's just harder. It's going to take longer, um, and it's it's nice to get some some quick wins of the right kind. So, so on that note, you, you know, as a marketing faculty leader at, at Wharton, right? You teach executive education. Uh, you teach MBAs. Describe to us this kind of who do you envision as a Renaissance CMO? Right. What does she look like? What does he look like? What what are kind of how are they able to balance the analytics with other dire directions in terms it's, of the creativity? It's going to be starting with the analytics. That that that's the key, and we're seeing more and more of that these days. Mm -hmm. Is uh, is is folks who are are coming to the the the, the marketing function and and maybe even the CMO position from a technical background. For for mm -hmm. most companies, the CMO is someone who just did the, the purely creative stuff. And by the way, I'm not criticizing the importance of, of, of the creative. No, um, but it's got to be much more than that. And there's too many CMOs I talk to, and I'll try to raise some of the analytic things, and they'll say, oh, yeah, yeah, we fully embrace that. There's someone who works for someone who works for me, and they do all that kind of stuff, and you can talk to them if you want to. So they'll, they'll kind of implicitly you know, downgrade the importance of it. Um, mm. So I want people who are who are leading. I mean, the CMO is not just the marketing organization, but the CMO who's leading with the technical, who really, really understands the metrics and the models and the interplay of acquisition and retention and the importance of winning over finance. 
Uh, and we're seeing more and more people like that. Again, it's a generational shift. We can't we can't just snap our fingers and make it happen. Um, but it's just been am amazing to see. Uh, and, and it makes me feel really, really good about the kind of future of the field of marketing. You know, a lot of people talk about the CMO as this kind of revolving door position. There's a reason why. Uh, and I think we're making a great strides to change that. Um, uh, you know, so for some companies, it means actually changing the name of the position. Let's not even call it a CMO anymore because that is all that baggage. So, you know, so let's call it, you know, a, a chief customer officer or a chief revenue officer. CRO, yeah, uh, exactly. Uh, um, I love that. So, uh, so again, it, it's a matter, It's it, as you said, it's all about balance. It's all about balance, balancing the, the, the creative with the quantitative. But I'll say uh, the, 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 the quanti analytical parts, they're, they're kind of harder to become an expert at. They're harder to um, you know, get the other marketers to understand that. So that's the stuff you really need to lead with. And then it's enough to say, hey, you know, I or people who work for me are just astonishingly good at the creative. And we value that too. Just you know, shifting the balance a little bit. So what, interestingly, one of the things that is not super well known about you is that you were recognized by Advertising Age as one of top 25 marketing technologists, and you were the only academic credentialed one uh, in that esteemed group. And, you know, I'm, I'm kind of curious as to what's your take on the role of technology, because increasingly when you look at, for example, software as a service Span people say that CMOs own more of the budget than the CIOs in some cases and in, in some organizations. How are you it's, looking at that and the role of the technology? Is it helping? Is it sometimes misguiding, uh, like any other tool? And, you know, yeah, what's your perspective. I, I, it's it's just the same old song that I've been singing for my thirty something years on the Wharton faculty. You know, in the beginning it was scanner data. Ooh, when we put scanners in stores and we could start to track who was buying what when. And then it became, as we started getting the 360 degree view of the customer, CRM systems back in the early 90s. And then it turned into big data. And now it's AI. And it's the same thing every time, which is we just throw a ton of money at the technology. It's just, you know, let's just build the thing. And then, you know, and then money will come raining down from the sky. And it never happens that way. It never has happened. It never will happen. And again, the, the, a lot of the, the, the CRM stuff from the early 90s, a lament that continues just as much today, uh, where we built all these systems and we gave all this money you know, to the, the CIO, CTO, hey, build this thing. And, um, uh, uh, but, but why? Why are we building it? What are we going to do with it? <laughs> and it's kind of important to have real crisp, clear answers to those questions before you build it. And to be able to give strong priorities to those folks to say, here's the sequence of things we should build in terms of the ROI we're going to get from them, not in terms of the, the ease or, or, or cost of building them. So again, we see it all the time. Uh, and so I'm just trying to get companies to think first, <laughs> again, prioritize through the, the customer data, even if we haven't even collected it yet. Mm -hmm. From what we've learned from other companies, just anticipating, you know, what it is that we're going to see or what it is that we need to see, let's build that stuff out first, even if it's not the sexiest, even if it's not the cheapest. Um, so it, 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 there really needs to be a, a bona fide partnership between marketing and technology. And, um, you know, I got to tell you, as hard as it's been to build that bridge between marketing and finance, um, I, I think we've done a, a great job of it with some of this work on customer-based corporate valuation. Not to say every company's embraced it. It's a generational mm. thing. But the, 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 the marketing technology thing, there's still a lot of tension there. There's still a lot of um, misunderstanding, a lot of turf. Uh, and it's still a long way to go. And the problem is because technology keeps changing. And so we keep coming up with new technologies. And this is where we're kind of figuring out the old one. It's like, okay, here comes the new one. Um, so that's a really tough thing. And it's just hard for a, a CMO, even for a CEO to step yeah. and say, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. We're going to walk before we run with this thing. Um, it's very, very hard to do that when all your competitors are running. Yeah. And it feels like one of the fundamental challenges is the attribution models, right? Like of, of who touches what, where do leads come from? 
you know, and the 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 big surprise to us, at least in in the running. Uh, the digital body language of how people consume marketing collateral or proposals is the overall level of ignorance by the marketing uh, professionals and design professionals who are, you know, putting a lot of creativity, a lot of sweat, blood and tears into this content that it's very disconnected from a just like, do people actually read it? What do they read? Where do they click? Where do they spend their time? And it's not some vague little cloud of, you know, pretend uh, screen screen time. It's the actual clicks. And so discovering that just opens people's eyes in terms of what's working and what's what and where they could allocate the resources, which is another big part of marketing spend is actually, you know, content creation and and then driving people to that content and so if the content that's created is not is blocking people from from engaging with your ideas clearly that's an unlocking opportunity so what's your take on having gone through years of actual behavior analysis and you talked about it a little bit you know where are the gaps that you see right and we probably are more exposed to b2b businesses you you see both b2b and B2C businesses where people are a little bit blinded uh, by either too much data, not getting to the essence or not enough data and kind of missing, missing the obvious. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's yeah, it's, it's, it's a really important question. And it goes back to uh, some of the work I was, uh, I was talking about earlier with, with respect to lifetime value, which is there's too many companies out there that say, okay, here's the data we have. What can we do with it? And they're not being like scientific about it. So mm-hmm. I want to really understand kind of the science of behavior. That's my job. Mm-hmm. Um, and then start to say, okay, well, what kind of data do I need to, to kind of, you know, bring that to life, to kind of answer those scientific questions? to build that forecasting model instead of just, you know, what kind of data we have, what can we do with it? Uh, and you're absolutely right. You, you, you mentioned, you know, attribution models. A lot of that stuff is just bad because we're trying to make attributions with very, very limited touch points that are kind of being measured badly. They're disconnected from each other. There's there's, there's just nothing holistic about it. Um, you know, we're kind of basically to, to echo on that, it's, it's like the sort of very – funnel-based view of customers, right? Especially as you know, in complex journeys, that is almost, uh, you know, it's a model. It's probably better than nothing, but it's definitely not a reality of how people go down the the journey, right? Especially in large organizations. Exactly right. We impose this structure on it without saying, well, what does the data really tell us? And then what other data do we need to take mm-hmm. our, our our bona fide story and and, and bring it to life, uh, and so it's uh, I think it's just really important for us to kind of you know think first again. Um, uh, let's do the science. Let's understand what kind of data we need. Let's ask ourselves what kind of decisions we'd make on the basis of it, um, and and then design and invest from there. Uh, and 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 of course, you know, r- right underneath the question you asked, and my answer to it is exactly the technology that that, that you built, which I think is is, is fabulous. Uh, and and the, the very very fact that I'm not only an investor in your firm, but but a user of your technology at Theta, a big time user of it, uh, is because we really really believe in the quality of the data. The ability to really know who's doing what, uh, and, and again, in a, in a very comprehensive, holistic way, where we can really fit it all together. We can tell just a much more complete, accurate, actionable story about customer behavior. That interaction with, you know, what what bits of content are they are they reading, as well as, you know, what 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 can we uh, understand about um, uh, what what uh, what other kinds of actions that they've taken, and you know the, the sequence of, of things that they they've clicked on, and and so on. Uh, it, it's 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 a no brainer. Um, but because it's it because it's first of all an emerging technology, it's you know it's somewhat unconventional. So a lot of people would say, well, that doesn't fit into our tech stack. Well, fine. It means your tech stack is wrong. Fix it. Goes back to my point about how people are letting the technology. Uh, lead the insights instead of the other way around. And hard to get people past that. And so I, I think this also relates to, you know, why Nike bought your previous firm, Zodiac, right? They loved the data, but they they clearly wanted to do something proprietary with that data. 
right? And I think what, when we talk about interactions and capturing the engagement data and deep granular analytics from those interactions, the idea here, um, and the I think how you want to apply your insights is that this is not just for the data capture, maybe some analytics. Ultimately, if a company gets a hold of this information, they're going to change how they do business. They're going to change how they engage with their customers. They're going to ch change when they're going to engage with their customers. They're going to have a, a much more sophisticated uh, array of ways to drive you know, the deals or transactions, but more importantly, the relationship forward, right? And, and so, uh, so, true. So, so why do you think... Um, you know, I, I think you've mentioned a little bit of different different teams sometimes, right? In the organization, the success customer success team is probably the very far from the customer analytics team in some ways. What do you think we could do to to create a culture where people take that insights, right? Like whether it's from from the models that you're building and your students are building, or from um, from from a platform like ours, and actually incorporate that into a loop where you start changing uh, the behaviors of you towards your customers. Yeah, it's, it's, that, and that's why, I, I, okay, so let's talk uh, top down and bottom up to answer that question. First from top down, it's just great to have a visionary CEO who gets this. Uh, you, you mentioned the uh, Nike buying my previous company, Zodiac. Let's give a lot of credit to, to Mark Parker, their previous CEO. And, and by the way, they did this in a position of strength. Nike was doing great, but they knew they could be doing better. And they wanted mm -hmm. to connect all the different data sources that they can you know, tag and track their, their customers um, and draw insights from it and figure out what actions to take. And that's why they kind of looked around and they kind of needed to, they, they, they on their own figured out what kind of technologies they need instead of just saying what technologies are sexy and what are our competitors doing? Uh, and, and so again, it was just very strategic. Here's what we need to know. Here's the technology we need to enable that. That's exactly where uh, where Zodiac came in. It was it was just great to see the way not, not only them buying the firm, but the way they then integrated it within the organization. So you know, we'll see those kinds of top down examples um, again. I wish there were more of them, but from the generational standpoint, I think we will we will see more of them. And then there's the bottom up. So what I want to do again, this is self-serving. Maybe it's it's. I got these models. They're really good. They can drive a lot of different decisions. Whether it's about marketing, whether it's about finance, whether it's about customer experience, even supply chain, talent management. You know, uh, M and A. Um, and uh, so so my job has been, and that's this is really more about what goes on in book number two. Um, mm -hmm. So how do we implement a winning strategy based on lifetime value? So how do you come up with a use case for each part of the organization? So instead of trying to you know force the people in R&D or accounting to say, here's our models, you must use them, to say, here's why you want to use our models. Here's why you're going to be, you're going to find greater success and be a better internal hero and why, hey, we can work together. Um, uh, and so it's so that's on me to basically come up with those seemingly unrelated use cases that that relate to the models. Uh, and again, a lot of that I've, I'm, I've been very proud of, of what I've been able to accomplish. And a lot of this because of just really smart, clever people in other organizations who have who have done some of this stuff on their own and me saying, I'm going to steal that idea and share it with other companies. Uh, and, and it's been, been great to see the, that, that breadth of use cases kind of elevating the, the importance of, of, of kind of customer measurement and lifetime value and all that across the organization. I love hearing Peter, how you take ownership for distributing your ideas and your research and your insights and, you know, anybody who's watching this or who's listening to this can't but feel the energy and excitement that emanates out of you and the passion for your work. Um, and I'm not surprised that your students want to go in business with you and and uh, and do, uh, you know, do companies together and, and apply the research. So tell me a little bit about how do you personally you know, continue, you've been teaching for nearly 35 years. Um, if my math is correct, you correct me. Uh, oh, it's more than that, but it's all good. That, but I, we'll, we'll... I like being younger. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, 
you're you've got the passion you're you've got fans uh of, of students you know collaborators um what do you what do you you what do you think about besides the model and the analytics in terms of bringing your full self into how you communicate and how do you create these changes in other people other organizations um that you know you're you're impacting with your content so it's, it's a combination of, of things N number one um, I, I, I just love this stuff. It's, I, it, I just find it inherently interesting. You know, for a lot of faculty, it's like, oh, no, I got to go teach. I'm going to turn my brain off because I got to go into the classroom. And, and, and no, no, for, for me, it's, I, I, I teach my research. I commercialize. It, it, all, it just all fits together. It's really, really nice. It's, it's kind of seamless in a way. Um, so, so that's, I, I, it's it's really really fun uh number two not a lot of people do it so a lot mm. of the, the not just the lifetime value thing but even these actuarial models that are referred to they're not very common you know for every one of me doing these probability models there's ten thousand you know machine learning people out there and, that, and that's powerful stuff i'm not knocking it but i it, so part of it is there's kind of i'm, I'm on a mission from God, there's a lot of gospel spreading just to try to get some of these methods out there because they're really good. So yeah, you know, if I'm not going right. to do it, who is? Yeah. Um, and finding the interplay between them and, and other kinds of methods. Uh, and so that's number two. And this is going to sound really weird. But uh, remember, I wasn't like born to do this stuff. Uh, and uh, a lot of the models that I'm using now I didn't even understand. I couldn't have done the math when I first started as a professor here. Um, and so th there are a lot smarter people out there. So I came up with all kinds of tricks and, and, and gimmicks to try to learn a lot of the stuff myself. Um, and I just find that, you know, hey, if it worked for me, it's going to work for other people. So so when I'm teaching this stuff, it's just great to see the light bulbs go off. It's great to see people who either... They're either math phobic. Oh, I never want to do it all the integral mm -hmm. in my life. Um, uh, or, or they love math, but they've never found the right application for it. And to get them to see, ah, this is what it's all about. Um, so I, I, I just love the teaching part of it. Uh, that even if it doesn't lead to to great research or, or great commercial applications, it's just a, it's just a, a really fun three hours to to kind of talk to people about this stuff, and get them just to kind of you know think about the world a little bit differently, uh, you know even if it's just almost I don't want to say entertainment because I'm doing integrals and nasty things like that, but even if it is just stuff for them to kind of you know forget about the rest of the world and just think about different stuff for a while, even if they never ever make use of it, um that that that's still good with me. That's amazing that you are able to combine your passion your your scholarship you know application of it what do you think um has been changing in the way the business schools operate right especially as other alternative for transferring just knowledge alone come about in the startup worlds or as you know accelerator programs i i've mentored in one and then joined it because i found some value in this um you know you've seen working over quite a few, uh, you know, decades now. Uh, how's it evolving and how's it adapting to the new world uh, that we live in where there's the, the knowledge of business is more distributed? Um, mm -hmm. Yep, no, you, you said it yeah. exactly right. Let, let's talk about that that distributed theme, more distributed theme yeah. in a couple of different ways. Number one, it's more distributed across the different business disciplines that it used to be that everyone coming here is going to, it, it was, it was, you know, a lot of people still call it the Wharton school of finance. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and when I first started, I couldn't even spell the word entrepreneurship. Still have a hard time with it. Um, uh, and Those you know, French uh, words. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, so just a lot of other areas of business, entrepreneurship, marketing, um, you know, uh, just so, so many areas that 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 people just would have never thought of taking courses in, you know, when I started all those years ago and are now like, cool, analytics being probably the most uh, a prominent example of that. So there's just much broader interest across the disciplines. There's much more of a balance mm -hmm. if you look at the enrollments in our courses. Now, finance is still a big kahuna. Let's let's not 
deny that. Um, but but you know, marketing statistics, operations, uh, it's 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 much kind of fairer uh, than it used to be. That that so that that's one big part of it. Um, it's also going to be much more distributed across uh, different industries. So again, I, everyone would either rush to Wall Street. Um, uh, yeah, but 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 today, even if you're doing finance, you know, we, we, or, or or these other areas. Uh, you know, again, retail is much cooler. Media and entertainment. So many people are going into to things with with much more. Let's say, say uh, you know, an ESG flavor to them. You know, this whole new center on like climate change and so on. So there's just uh, besides the the, the the skills that people have, uh, the the areas that they go into is is just much more distributed than ever before. And the third part, again, it's corny, but I believe in it, is, is the whole global thing, mm. uh, which is, you know, every example used to be just U.S., U.S., U.S. Uh, part of it was ignorance, because <clears throat> that's all we know. Part of it was arrogance, because we're the best, and so we're going to, you know, we're going to tell the rest of the world how to operate. That's all wrong. Uh, and so there's just going to be just, just much more uh, interchange with students from other uh, countries, with companies from other countries, uh, and 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 bringing that into our research. So so again, let, let's think about data structures and so on that might exist elsewhere, but not here in the U.S. How can I build my lifetime value models around them and making that both you know an intellectual exercise as well as one that can have a lot of practical applicability for a much broader array of, of companies and geographies than the ones I might have been talking to back in the late 80s. So that's fascinating. Let's touch back on the international theme a little bit. So um, lots of companies, when they expand to the new markets, they take the model that works in their core market. Uh, they kind of forget that they took quite a few years to get to that market, that there were early adapter segments and and then later move more to mainstream and they plunk that model into their kind of emerging markets and then have some disappointing results until they restart almost treating it as a as a new venture with some you know benefits of lessons learned but not one to one comparison how does your research help companies uh, avoid making these mistakes and kind of uh, maybe uh you know, try to understand the the mom, the moments in the market and how do you all change it over over time? I, Alex, you're so good at setting up these questions. I love it. Gives me a chance to kind of wave around book number three. Okay. <laughs> um, so let's kind of abstract away from purely the you know uh, international market entry piece to the ask the broader question just about as we acquire different cohorts of customers, even if we're doing it purely domestically, right. um, let's understand how each of those groups of customers are different from each other, how we can anticipate what the next group is going to look like and kind of build our business in a way that's forward looking instead of saying, well, what? Well, what did the customers look like? So a really big part of my research and a really big part of book number three, the customer-based audit, is the idea of really understanding customer cohorts. So when we're analyzing a customer base, we're not just analyzing the customer base. Yeah, we don't want the averages. Always, we don't exactly. want the averages. And, the, yeah. and so exactly your point. So the first way we're going to oh, de-average yeah. – First way we're going to do it is to break it down into cohorts. Let's look at the tranches of customers that we've acquired, usually at different points in time, although it could be different geographies, different channels, different whatever. But let's focus on points in time um, and just understand how they're different from each other in terms, first of all, in terms of just their, their overall goodness. Are we acquiring better and better customers or more frequently, slightly worse, slightly worse customers. Um, uh, and then let's de-average on that basis as well. Why are they worse? Is it because they don't buy as often? They don't spend as much? They don't stay as long? Um, so that, that de-averaging ripples down. But the idea of, of, of doing analyses on a cohort by cohort basis to play connect the dots across those cohorts to understand what that next one's gonna look like and to make sure that we're in a position to A, not be surprised when we acquire those customers and B, to find success with them. Uh, uh, it's kind of 
obvious to talk about, but companies tend not to do it really well. And one of the reasons why is because they've never really thought about it. It's one thing to think about the, the companies that we're going to start with the US and go to UK and then go to Germany and then um but uh but but underneath all that would be the customers. And when we start thinking about the customer cohorts and, and even asking ourselves, how are the geographic distribution of those cohorts shifting? Um, it's going to be just so much more insightful than just pretending that either the next one's going to be the same as the last one, which is not true, um, or that uh, we'll figure it out when we get there, um, which is so mm, cohort level analyses. It's so obvious, so easy, but it's not nearly as, as common as it should be. Well, brilliant way to wrap up. Where can people find uh, these not obvious insights or obvious insights that are not getting done, Peter? Where can they find you? Where can they find your books and your your company? Uh, guide us a little bit on that so that uh, sure. this would be an actionable insights, which is what we, we're all about uh, with um, you and with us. I love it. So, well, first of all, if they want to find me, I, I don't, I don't hide very well. So, you know, yeah. Google my name, you'll find everything. Um, the, 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 and again, the, the three books are easy to find. If you just search fader, customer centricity, it all, it all comes up. Um, I do highly recommend for folks to take a look at, at theta, at, you know, theta clv.com, uh, not just cause it's, you know, the business and I'm trying to drum, drum up stuff here, but there's a lot of really cool content there that, that um, we, we've done uh, and, 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 you yourself have dealt with with Tara Heptonstall, our, our wonderful marketing person. Um, she's kind of my my mouthpiece to kind of take a lot of these ideas, a lot of these methods, and make them very very accessible and make them very interesting. And so Theta has been just a, a wonderful outlet of whether it's you know formal analyses and corporate valuations or just think about blog posts and so on. A lot of great content there. Uh, again, a lot of it powered by your own wonderful company. Um, and it's it's just it's good to have this stuff out there. And I really do hope that if people do find any of it interesting, even if they don't necessarily agree with it, but they want to find out more and learn more, connect with me on LinkedIn, follow me. I was going to say on Twitter, on X, X, um, <laughs> at Fader B, Threads too, um, and uh, and and it's uh, uh, you, you've already. Uh, uh, mentioned my my passion for the the topic. It's a conversation that I look forward to to keeping going with you and with anyone else who's interested. Brilliant. Well, couldn't recommend this more to my audience. Tara is wonderful. Peter is wonderful. Theta is wonderful. And the research <laughs> is going to change the way you run your business. Thank you very much, Peter, for joining us on Experience Focus Leaders. Absolutely, my pleasure, Alex. Keep up the good work. <laughs>